there are people who have to be paid to be Mitch McConnell's friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shitty job. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm, guys, I'm fair. Oh, sure. the working class has got to rise up. That's enough. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> I think that's 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 the call, right? That's the call to just be like shut it down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that last one is uh, a violation of the Geneva Conventions, you guys. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, as you might notice in this episode, you're probably going to hear some people laughing and, and, and kind of chatting in the background uh, with me th throughout the episode. And that's because it was filmed, uh, recorded earlier in front of a live virtual stand-up comedy audience. Uh, I do uh, these shows called the Citizen Revolution Live Virtual Stand-Up Comedy Shows, which become episodes of Forkful of Noodles. So if you're interested in being a part of that live virtual audience, you totally can uh, by clicking the ticket link in the description below. We are going to have a bunch of these shows throughout the year, especially because I am uh, unfortunately not able to tour and go around the country like I normally do. So I've got a bunch of these live virtual stand-up comedy shows each week brand new material each week we also find a brand new grassroots organization to uh to donate to uh to to partner up with uh this for this episode we partnered up with the pittsburgh mutual aid and if you would like to donate to them there is a link in the description for that as well uh and uh if you would like to get early access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles, both parts into one video, the, the multi-part episode. If you'd also like to see uh, what the Citizen Revolution uh, the shows are all about, the discussions that we have at the end of these shows, uh, you can do so by becoming a sustaining member. And you can go right onto my website, krishmohanhaha.com, and you can become a sustaining member there. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, become a sustaining member. You get early access to these full episodes. You get uh, unreleased stand-up comedy tracks, uh, storytelling content. You get some bonus merch. You get early access to, to my live comedy albums when I drop those. Uh, you get a bunch of cool perks, uh, and it helps the quality and quantity of these shows to improve as well. Uh, now, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. We're going to talk about West Virginia, you guys. West Virginia has, uh, is a state that's often the butt of uh, many people's jokes for being the home of backwoods, toothless, inbred hicks, right? Some, some people might even know what... <laughs> that's usually the jokes that come out for, uh, about West Virginia. <laughs> They're usually true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Been> very... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some people might also know West Virginia for its country <laughs> roads that will take you home whether you want to go there or not. To the place <laughs> We can't turn this into a karaoke show. Damn it. Look. West Virginia. <laughs> I, I brought this on myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I guess according to John Denver, all country roads either lead to Charleston or Beckley instead of Rome. That's where they all go. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing, you guys. Everything we know about West Virginia has been co-opted by corporate propaganda to push this narrative of ignorance, divide, and backwoods unimportance. Even the origins of West Virginia itself has been romanticized as this abolitionist dreamscape, right? This, the story that we're told about West Virginia is that they annexed from like regular Virginia because they didn't want slavery. But in reality, it, it had nothing to do 
with abolition at all, but everything to do with Civil War supply lines. And there were plenty of people in the state of West Virginia that were very excited about owning people. <laughs> Now, famed $5 bill, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he, <laughs> Abe Lincoln went to uh, the Northern industrialists who owned most of the railroads, timber, and coal yards and offered them up West Virginia as compensation for helping out the Union Army. The real story is, is that in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln had to keep the supply lines open. He had to keep his troops supplied. And so he made a deal with the owners of the railroad, which were the Northern industrialists. And he said, keep my troops supplied. Let's get through this Civil War. And that beautiful little piece of land known now as West Virginia will be yours. Lots of coal, lots of timber, lots of money to be made in West Virginia. And that's what happened. So in 1863, this place became what's now known as the 35th state, West Virginia. Now, Lincoln essentially sold the state out to profiteers as the state's inception, right? Really, West Virginia is the first state to become a corporation. Therefore, it is the first state to get personhood, which is very exciting and also kind of a bummer because for like a long time black people were like only three-fifths of a person but like West Virginia just got all of the fifths of being a person like pretty immediately it's kind of shitty it's kind of shitty thing to do but after the Civil War West Virginia basically became the spot for the coal industry to get cheap labor and this is this is really where the real history of West Virginia begins. Between 1880 and 1919, the state's population went from 93,000 to 446,000. And this is because the coal companies built little towns around coal mines and needed people to occupy and work the mines. By the time Ellis Island opened up in the 1890s, the coal bosses sent out recruiters to bring immigrants into the mines. So the coal industry sent guys to places like Ellis Island to the ports and they would pluck us off the boats and say, hey, you sir, are you looking for that new life? Are you looking for work? Are you looking for everything you've ever dreamed of? Get your bags, get your family, come with us. And they put us on trains and they brought us to West Virginia and they put us to work mining coal. Now, the recruiters promised these immigrants, you know, a new life, you know, to, to help them take care of their families. And at this point, too, there were some pretty large strikes that had taken center stage, um, and the working class were becoming far more empowered as well. Uh, so in order to circumvent things like, you know, paying like fair wages and giving people human dignity, the coal bosses hired the immigrants that didn't have an opportunity to become part of the labor movement so they could be very easily exploited for the work. You know, this is kind of how business is done, right? This is what MBAs teach you. When you get a master's in business, this is, this is like lesson 101. Step one, hire immigrants. Step two, exploit immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> Step three, purchase respect, always keep the receipts. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> you never know when you need to return that respect, right? And then you get your master's degree in business, you guys. That's how it works. But <laughs> this, this notion alone debunks the whole, they took our jobs argument, right? Nobody took anybody's job. The bosses handed the, uh, these jobs to the immigrants under the guise of better lives for their families, right? The jobs were there for the taking, but the working class didn't really want any of these jobs, right? The people weren't really into the coal industry all that much. They, they, liked, it. they liked the coal industry as a friend. You know what I'm saying? Like they... <laughs> 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 
but they weren't ready to commit. So in a jealous rage, the coal industry <laughs> decided to use immigrants against the working class. And, and the, the sad part about that is it kind of worked, right? Like, like these corporations- They're in an entanglement. <laughs> they're in an entanglement, yes. <laughs> Which is a Will and Jada Pickett Smith reference. <laughs> <laughs> but these corporations essentially created and benefited from anti immigrant xenophobia. Now, once these immigrants, and also they were hiring former slaves in these coal, town, coal towns as well, uh, they, they weren't paid by the hour, uh, by the hour, right? They were paid by the ton. It depended on how much ton of coal you ex extracted from the earth. So it didn't matter how many hours you put in. But here's the real kicker. They weren't paid in real dollars. They were paid in something called scrip, which was made up by the coal bosses. Miners were paid in scrip. Um, oftentimes, never saw real money. And if, if the company caught you with real money, you might well lose your job or they'd put you in a bad place to work until you understood that you were supposed to deal only at the company store and such. I had some, I had some uh, uh, hard ass bosses. I had some hard bosses then. And uh, if they could put it over on you, if they could put it over on you, that'd make you do any damn thing for nothing. That guy is from uh, like, like he, fought in the mine wars, which we're going to talk about in a, in a minute. The videos that he's involved in are fucking awesome. He's a badass. But the script is kind of where monopoly money originated, right? Because it's basically play money. It, it, it's disguising a new era of wage slavery is really what it was doing. And this kept the miners subservient and dependent on the coal companies. And it ensured that these coal bosses in West Virginia were kind of going to be richer than God. You know, and in these company towns, the fake money was used to pay for lodging, supplies, and utilities. These towns were all also primarily in non-union areas in southern West Virginia. These towns also had mercenaries hired by the coal bosses to ensure that the miners would stay in line and not unionize. The coal bosses called these places company towns, but in reality, they were forced labor camps. Eventually, the Nazis would look at this and go, hey, that's actually not a bad idea. You know? <laughs> Pretty decent idea these guys are coming up with. But up north, the United Mine Workers of America, or the UMWA, or the Miners Union, had partnered with the International Workers of the World to engage in strikes. Mother Jones, the Oxnardarian activist, joined UMWA and Eugene Debs in Pittsburgh, my hometown of Pittsburgh, to lead a pretty massive strike in 1897, which was the first victory for the miners' union. They were having a lot of trouble gaining uh, a foothold, especially in places like Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And in 1897, they, they struck a pretty major victory thanks to the UMWA, Mother Jones, and Eugene Debs. Now, following all this, Mother Joan, uh, she also led strikes and demonstra demonstrations all across Pennsylvania. Mother Jones was a, a huge, huge ag advocate for getting rid of child labor, right? She led a, a protest of young kids that worked in factories and mines on a march to Teddy Roosevelt's summer home in 1903. And I'm sure all of the rich folks, you know, that were sipping tea on their estates were shocked were just shocked at what was happening, you know? And they looked out at Mother Jones and they said, well, I mean, come on, why do you have to make child labor so political? You know, you're just <laughs> <laughs> politicizing all this ch children working. <laughs> By the way, Mother Jones might literally be the only person that Teddy Roosevelt was terrified of, which is awesome <laughs> in, my, in my book. <laughs> now, Eventually, she did go down to West Virginia to survey some of these mines, right? When she saw the conditions of workers down there, she said that this was worse than those in Tsarist Russia. That's right, folks. Authoritarian Russians, 
drew a line at slave labor camps. And American industrialists basically said, but what if we sold the idea to like German nationalists though? Would you guys, would that be cool? <laughs> now, if you really think about it today, like these work conditions aren't particularly all that different, right? We've, we've heard stories from Amazon warehouses where people are passing out from dehydration, right? Meat packing plants have unsanitary conditions for their workers cramped in one space for hours on end. And especially now we, we've seen a lot, of, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people that work in these meat packing plants uh, get uh, COVID-19, they, uh, they get the virus, right? Uh, it spreads very quickly within those work environments. Walmart employees are paid so little that customers have to help them buy food. There, there's an intern right now that has to pretend that Joe Biden isn't a warmongering sociopathic racist on Twitter every single day, you guys. <laughs> that is somebody's job. And, uh, <laughs> and not just that, there are people who have to be paid to be Mitch McConnell's friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shitty job. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm, guys, I'm fair. Oh, certain. the working class has got to rise up. That's enough. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> I think that's 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 the call, right? That's the call to just be like shut it down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that last one is uh, a violation of the Geneva Conventions, you guys. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> now, in order to prevent the UMWA from gaining a foothold in West Virginia, the coal bosses came up with something called yellow dog contracts in 1907. These contracts were uh, basically said that miners were the sole employees, a term that's used very loosely in this circumstance, uh, of the coal company. And they are by law not allowed to join any union. And these laws, these contracts specifically called out the United Mine Workers of America and the International Workers of the World. And if they did join a union, they would be terminated and evicted from their homes by the coal companies. Boo. Yes, boo is the correct response to that. <laughs> uh, in 1917, the US Supreme Court made them legally binding and ensured that the unions couldn't gain an attraction in the states where uh, they were using things like yellow dog contracts, right? The provision of the coal companies were, uh, to the coal companies was that you know, they had to like walk the miners once a day uh, and make sure that they were going to be fed and clean up after their poopies. Uh, they really had to show that they were like ready for the responsibility of owning a miner. You know, it's a, it's a big responsibility. And then the, at, at the end of the day, the Supreme Court of 1917 was really asking, you know, who's walking who? That's really the question. And after a series of general strikes and mass organizing, finally in 1933, the yellow dog contracts were put down like that feral rabies ridden canine at the end of that one movie. Uh, what was it? Uh, oh yeah, Marnie and Me. You guys remember that? <laughs> now, these contracts, much like the script, were meant to keep employees in fear and subservient to the whims of the coal bosses, especially since the labor movement was getting wind of their tyranny. It made sure that these workers today wouldn't resist or strike and would be loyal, kind of like a yellow dog, right? Now today, we don't really need yellow dog contracts because we have the burden of health care. With the power of health care connected to your work, it's easy to see how employees can be kept subservient under the threat of losing access to a doctor, not just for them, but for their entire family. Coal miners all around the world, or, or rather all around the country, uh, were, were basically treated less valuable than the coal that they were extracting from the mountains. Make you work unsafe or anything, would well, Oh, yeah. yeah and, nowhere, nowhere, the miner would leave before daylight 
I'm going to be away in the, that night before you get home. Mm -hmm. I'll come in, I'll come in late in the floor, or maybe two, three, four hours sleep. When you come in, never change, never, never take a bath. If you lay down on the floor and sleep, and you get me up, put me out of the next morning, back to work again. So, fast forward to 1913. Uh, in Paint and Cabin Creek, West Virginia, the miners did go on a strike, backed by the Miners Union and Mother Jones. The miners were basically asking for union legitimacy and better wages. And by better wages, they meant like, you know, like real money. <laughs> <laughs> now, the coal company basically freaked out and said that the union was working for a competitor uh, and was out to ruin their business. I mean, does this kind of make the coal bosses sound like crazy paranoid prospectors, right? They're just like, oh, look out, they're coming for my gold. Oh, my black gold, oh no. <laughs> just... <laughs> they're prospectors, but they're also ghosts, you know? Because... <laughs> <laughs> this is from 1913. They can't, can't expect it. So there are also prospector ghosts. <laughs> so, now, as retaliation for asking for, you know, like real money and human rights, uh, the coal bosses hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. And now these guys weren't as much detectives as they were like hired mercenaries, you know? Honestly, if they went by Baldwin Feltz Union Hunters, it would have been way more accurate. But it would have, I'll admit, it would have kind of made them look bad, right? It would kind of made them look like a bunch of assholes. Now, before <laughs> the, it would have, you know, but before the yeah. SS invented, yeah, before the Nazis invented the SS, they looked at these so-called detective agencies and were like, that's not a bad idea, you guys. Oh, Jesus man. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but we gotta upgrade we gotta upgrade our detective agency so we're gonna give them cool lightning bolts on their uniform you know really <laughs> brand this fascism oh my god very important <laughs> guys none of us here can say that the coal companies weren't inspirational this depends on who you're inspiring <laughs> got me there <laughs> Now, the coal companies basically gave these mercenaries machine guns and set up encampments to fire on striking miners. So the miners fought back with guerrilla warfare. Martial law was instated three times, which was virtually unprecedented in peacetime, right? 200 strikers, including the 86-year-old Mother Jones, were, was arrested uh, by the end of the strike. And you really got to... Yeah, guys, you really got to watch out for those octogenarians, okay? With their frail backs and, and their canes, you know, and their hard candies, which is a dental nightmare. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, you say that, but Mother Jones was that bitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. She, yeah. She did, <laughs> she did scare the shit out of Teddy Roosevelt, so... <laughs> I would have. I, I she had the big stick. She had the big stick. <laughs> I would have. I would have bet as they were arresting her, she had like some badass line like, "You think these prisons can hold me?" And they're just. <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> like that's the kind of harsh talking to that she probably gave them. <laughs> I know your. I know your mother, young man. <laughs> <laughs> Penning her a letter. <laughs> now, uh, eventually, the, the new governor of West Virginia, Governor Hatfield, pardoned some of these strikers, right? But he kept the main organizers of the strike in prison, such as Mother Jones. Uh, and the cherry on the authoritarian cake was when he closed down every single one of the town's socialist newspapers because... 
well, I don't know. Let's just say like liberty or like freedoms. Uh, and I, I like Russia. Let's just go ahead and say those three things. Because that seems fair. USA. <laughs> USA. <laughs> 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 Now, the next major strike in West Virginia wouldn't happen until 1920, right? The UMWA had launched a major campaign to unionize coal mines in southern West Virginia specifically. As retaliation with the now legally binding yellow dog contracts, 3,000 miners were fired and served eviction notices. When the miners didn't leave, the Baldwin Feltz thugs were called in to violently remove them from their homes. In the town of Maytuan in Mingo County, Al and Lee Feltz, the lead mercenaries of the Baldwin Feltz, some people would like to call them owners, but they're, they're the lead mercenaries. That's what they are. Now, they came down to personally evict some of these miners, right? Uh, now, Maytuan's strike-supporting sheriff, Sid Hatfield, was backing the miners up, and the Feltz decided that uh, they need to push women and children out of, the t out of their homes at gunpoint because they really respect that rule of women and children first. You know, they're very old school. You got to respect those traditional rules. Like if this was like the Titanic, they would have thrown the women and children overboard first. That's how traditional they were. And that's called equality, you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really how you gotta do it you know? <laughs> so the felts with the mayor of Meituan took these miners families to the train station to evict them so Sid Hatfield with a group of miners followed them to the train station and said that the felts were under arrest for unlawful eviction then the felt said that Sid Hatfield was under arrest because uh, they said so and no taxi backsies. So <laughs> <laughs> laid down the law. <laughs> now, eventually during this heated exchange, shots were fired. And I'm not talking about like in a verbal way, right? Like somebody didn't come out and was just like, yo, mama, so fat, her bathtub called her Grover Cleveland. Like it's a... Uh, <laughs> hey, those are fighting words, man. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I would have fucking killed it as a comedian in 1921. I would have nailed it. <laughs> but no, a little. There was like a little. <laughs> There was literal gunfire, right? And there was a lot of arguments <laughs> after this happened about who shot first. And the answer is, uh, it was Han. Han definitely shot first. He's the first one. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. <laughs> now, the shootout lasted about 10 minutes. And within those 10 minutes, seven detectives, two minor miners, and the mayor of Beituan himself were killed. 17 strikers and Sid Hatfield were tried for, I don't know, uh, like not worshiping coal and Russianism. I, did, I do think that they meant to probably say Bolshevism, but Russianism kind of sounds scarier, doesn't it? Like, like when I said that, couldn't you just see like two bearded men with hammers and sickles like trying to hunt down a family of bald eagles? Couldn't you just see that? <laughs> now, in 1921, they did get acquitted. These folks did get acquitted, but Sid Hatfield was murdered by the Baldwin Felts in front of the courthouse. This essentially sparked a 5,000 minor march to Charleston. Back, back by the UMWA, these miners with their red neckerchiefs tied on tight they basically said that they were not going to back down until their demands were met. And at this point, they had been lied to by the coal bosses. The courts had let them down by legitimizing yellow dog contracts. And the government had let them down by arresting strikers by, by the use of mercenaries. So 
They trusted the unions who were on the side of these working class miners. President Harding, who was the president at the time, sent down Brigadier General Hen Henry Bad Bandholtz uh, to, to basically offer an ultimatum to the miners, right? But the miners rejected any compromise and kept the march going to Logan County. The sheriff of Logan County was a man named Dan Chafin, who, was an, who basically was an anti-union employee of the coal companies and was set on stopping these miners. The coal companies sent uh, their private armed forces and then Sheriff Chaffin deputized a bunch of uh, citizens in Logan counties. They called themselves the Logan Defenders. And then they killed five strike supporters as a message to the unions. By the time the miners did get to Logan County, Chaffin's men were armed with Gatling guns. So the miners with their rifles and handguns fought back against this private army of the coal company. Now, the military was ordered to use their bombers, but they declined to fire on citizens. So Schaffen went to the coal companies and he chartered three biplanes and dropped homemade explosives on the miners. And once the federal troops were ordered to get involved, the miners knew that they were going to be outgunned and outnumbered, so they surrendered. Now this is, what's, this is what we historically know as the Battle of Blair Mountain. This is a major moment in American history where not only were federal troops called on striking citizens, but a private corporation paid for the bombing of said citizens. And this is another example of how strikers made the decision to call off the violence and not the corporatists. Violence is pretty much like second nature to capitalists at this point. This right here is said to be a pretty major loss to the UMWA, but it did show the coal companies that the workers weren't going to back down without a fight. And this isn't taught to most of us because this history shows what we are capable of when we stand together and push back against tyrannical power structures. It shows us how much strength the working class actually has. And that's been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Make sure you get notifications from us. Hit the like button. Hit the share button. Get the word out about this show. Uh, content like this is often suppressed on a lot of the more mainstream corporate uh, video platforms. Uh, so, uh, and I think you guys know which one I'm talking about. Uh, so I depend on you guys to, to hit that like button, hit that share button, get the word out about these, uh, uh about these videos, about these shows. Uh, and, uh, there's also multiple different ways that you can, you can support a show like this. Uh, if you listen to the audio version of this show, you can write a review. If you listen to the video version, you can leave a comment. All of that stuff helps it, uh, get, get seen by more people. Um, but one of the things um, that you can do to financially contribute is either make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. Uh, sustaining members get uh, early access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. You get early access to albums. You get unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material. Uh, you get a bunch of cool stuff uh, every single week delivered directly into either your email or on the Patreon page. Various different ways where you can become a sustaining member you can become a sustaining member uh on on patreon on paypal on directly on my website itself uh you can become a sustaining member on on Bandcamp. various different ways that you can do it uh this just helps shows like this grow and uh it, it just makes the quality and quantity of the show get better and better uh, i'm going to be doing a bunch of these uh, these live virtual stand-up comedy shows, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show. So uh, go to my website and uh, and check out when the next one is, especially if you want to be a part of the live virtual stand-up comedy audience. Go to krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com to check out all of the, 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 the live virtual stand-up comedy dates the uh, sustaining memberships my album is available on on my website as well 
There's a bunch of cool shit on there. Uh, we're 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 gonna be throwing up a bunch of videos on this channel. Um, various different kinds of videos, videos like Fork Full of Noodles, more current events related videos, more looser ranty videos uh, as well. So there's a ton of content that comes out on this channel. Uh, we have, we're going to have some interviews that are going to be coming out as well. So uh, stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're getting notifications. Uh, until the next one, thanks for tuning in.